with a panel uh, having Leslie T. Chang, Peter Ressler, uh, and the topic is on uncovering the Arab Spring because they have been, well, they were living in Cairo for a number of years. Um, they wrote about it, uh, Peter mainly for The New Yorker, Leslie wrote for The Guardian, The New York Review of Books, and also some pieces for The New Yorker uh, online. And of course, they were there during uh, very important years uh, for, for that country. Uh, so the idea of having them here is also to know what they intend to do in the future in terms of uh, projects with the material uh, they, they collected there. So Peter and Leslie, thank you for, for being here. Um, I'll probably start by asking you, well, you lived in China for a long period, uh, and then uh, eventually you moved in 2011. Uh, to, um, to Egypt. How did that possibility come up and uh, why? Yeah, I mean, most people think, because we did move to Cairo in, in 2011, so that which was the year the Arab Spring started, so people often think that's why we moved there, but actually it had nothing to do with that. We, we left China in 2007. We had lived in China, both of us, for about 11 years. Um, and when we left, we had this idea that we would go back to the United, to the United States and write our China books. Leslie was working on factory girls. I was working on country driving. And then we thought we would go to a different place. We wanted to do something non-China and non-American. Um, and so we thought about this for a while. You know, we thought about something like, like India, um, but we sort of wanted a place where there was one language that you study to connect with the place. I also liked the idea of a place with a, with a deep history I enjoyed that in China, and I, I wrote my second book, had a lot of archaeology in it, and so I've, I've enjoyed places that have a, uh, a connection with the ancient past. So we, we decided when we left China in 2007 that we would eventually go to the Middle East and probably to Egypt. Um, and then, of course, we had two children in 2010. We had twins, um, and then we were thinking about making, preparing to make our move, uh, and the Arab Spring began. So the terms of the project really changed really dramatically, yeah. Uh, you mentioned something um, interesting, which is the, the language uh, topic. Uh, maybe we could start uh, there with you, Leslie. Um, Peter wrote in one of his articles that uh, language flows around you like a river when you are uh, an adult and you go to a country uh, in which language you, you don't uh, dominate. Uh, how was that um, adaptation for you and, and for Peter and your family in, in Egypt? Yeah, I think originally we were quite blasé about this project and we thought we would just kind of show up in Egypt with two tiny infants and start to learn Arabic. And we actually had a good friend who's a journalist who had spent time in the Middle East and he was like, you need to get some language training before you get here. Um, so we actually got a, a fellowship to go study at Middlebury um, College in the States in eight week, eight week Arabic felt much longer than eight weeks, but uh, uh, Arabic, and that gave us kind of a good grounding in um, classical Arabic fusha, which is not, which is different from the spoken dialect, but was a good grounding in reading and writing. Um, and then as soon as we got to Egypt, we started with a tutor, um, and basically the first year we went three times a week and studied Arabic. Um, it was a wonderful experience. It, it is really challenging, but it I mean, I, I think a lot of myths about learning languages, one is that, you know, after you're young, you can't learn a new language, and I think that is not true. I mean, it's mostly just when you're older, you don't have the time, and we certainly did not have the time that we did when we were young. We had two little kids, um, so time was limited, but, you know, you definitely can learn a new language even at the age of 40-something, which is what we did. Um, so it, even, the, we never got, so we were really, really fluent in the language, but we got so we could have simple conversations with people, and, even that was enough to really give us a sense of what was going on because you're just wandering around the neighborhood, you're talking to, to drivers and people who work there and you can get a pretty good sense of what people are feeling and it's often different from what's being portrayed in the press or even what the US Embassy is saying. Um, so it gave us a really valuable kind of close to the ground foundation of what was going on in the country. Uh, Peter, uh, for Leslie, uh, the Chinese experience was slightly different because I believe you, you spoke Chinese already when you moved to China. Yeah. Right? Uh, but you didn't when you moved to China, yeah. did you? Okay. So for the second time in your life, when you moved to Egypt, you were confronted with the same situation. And you also wrote that you cannot step into the same language twice. Mm -hmm. So how was it in Egypt in comparison to, 
uh, to China in stepping into a new culture and a new language? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I went to move to, I did have the experience of learning language when most people do. I, I grew up in Missouri in, in the middle of, of America and most people there didn't really value learning languages. I didn't really take it very seriously. So, and in high school and college, I never went overseas. And so, but I had this feeling that I would like to do that. I would like to have this opportunity. So it was an important, important idea for me. And so after graduate school, I, I joined the Peace Corps and I went to China when I was 27. And at that age, it was pretty, and I was in China, I was thrown into, uh, you know, a small city that had only one other foreigner, and really nobody could speak English very well in that city. Um, and I didn't have anything else to do, and there was no internet in those days, and so, I, you know, I, I learned Chinese pretty quickly, you know, got to a level of some fluency. Um, um, you know, Egypt was very different, and, you know, but it, that experience taught me that you know, I think there is this idea, as Leslie said, that children, are, it, that's the time to learn languages, but it's actually wonderful to learn as an adult because you pick up a lot of stuff that a child wouldn't. Um, you know, I, I'm currently working on a book about Egypt, and I have a chapter where I talk about learning Arabic after having learned Chinese, both as an adult, and sort of looking at the language texts, which are really, it's really fun to compare them. Like, the Chinese text is all, you know, it's all about government and politics and sort of, you know, you learning how to say People's Congress and how to say the Communist Party and this stuff comes in very early. It's all institutions and they're never letting, they're never showing anything, any of the cracks, although occasionally you can kind of sense it, like when you look at the translation exercise in the Chinese text that I use, this was in 1996, they have these sentences like one of them will be, you know, the Japanese delegation is coming tomorrow and then the next one is, only through guerrilla warfare can a revolution effectively be, you know, and they kind of whiplash you back and forth between violence, and you can tell, like, somebody, the grammarian must have had some traumatic experiences, and so, but, you, but, but you can only sense it indirectly, whereas the Egyptian text, there's no government, there's no institutions, you're not learning about the names of the Congress, or the, it's all families, um, and it's, it's, and, and often it's, it's also incredibly honest, like the families are not just families, but they're often behaving badly. You know, like the, the husband's yelling at his wife, why'd you make chicken again? Well, because you said you like chicken and this is your favorite dish. I don't want it today, you know, and, and, and just like, this is really funny dialogues, that, but you know, and it's kind of, there's this very lovable quality of Egyptians where they're really honest, whereas the Chinese are pretty careful. You know, and, and, and you can really sense that in language text. And so I, I, you know, this is the kind of thing you pick up as an adult. And it's why, one of the reasons why we want to do this. I think it was also the ultimate marriage test because we moved to Egypt with 17-month-old twins in the year of the revolution. Both of our twins were bitten by rats while they were sleeping with, within a, not long after our arrival. And we were taking language class for two hours a day with the two, just the two of us in, in a room with a language teacher. Um, so it was a pretty intense experience. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So language was definitely a challenge. Uh, I would uh, like to ask you if religion was also uh, an issue. Uh, of course, you moved to, to a country with, a, of course, uh, a very strong uh, Muslim religion background. So um, how was that for, your, for, for you, Leslie? Yeah, it was surprising to me because my image of Egypt, and I did not have much of a background at all before, I went, before, before we went there, was that Egypt is kind of an open country, a crossroads, um, a place that everyone has gone through and has, has affected the country. And all those things are true, but Egypt actually was much more conservative, socially, religiously, culturally conservative than I expected. Um, even from as simple a thing as walking down the street and almost every woman is veiled. And for whatever reason, I hadn't really been prepared for this um, when I arrived. So much of my time there was thinking, you know, once we learned the language, the basics of the language was thinking, I want to write about women, but how do I write about them? How do I get even get inside their houses and their villages um, because I'm so much of an outsider? Um, so it, w it was kind of a struggle for a long time to figure out how to find my subjects and yeah I mean you, you can't help being affected by how things around you are and you know I would walk around my neighborhood and if I was alone the men who owned the shops and and were around the neighborhood would say hi to me very respectfully but if I walked around the same neighborhood with Peter they would all ignore me they would only greet him and that just you just can't not be pissed off by that like they just stopped acknowledging me as a human the minute they see my husband 
but you know, I realize that it's because out of respect for him and for me, they're not making eye contact with me or even acknowledging me out of respect, like they're not. And that's just so messed up, you know, like why did I stop my losing, stop having my humanity just because my husband appeared. So it, it's all these things where just living and seeing how people respond to you as a woman really shape what eventually, you know, I ended up writing about and, and the feelings I have about what I'm writing about. Uh, looking, trying to look at uh, Egypt and, and Cairo in a more broader sense. So you arrived there in October 2011, if I'm correct? Yep. yep. Uh, so Ben Ali had been deposed already in, in Tunisia and then uh, Mubarak in, um, in Egypt. And what kind of uh, country and city uh, you found when you got there? Uh, in a more broader sense, I mean, how was the city at that moment in 2011? Yeah, it was a quiet time, relatively speaking. Um, it was sort of kind of an interlude between the first wave of the revolution and what was going to come. Um, Mubarak had been removed, he resigned in February of that year. And we arrived in October. There had been sort of a long stretch where not much was happening. There had been some scattered protests and a little bit of violence, but for the most part, not much. But then in November and December, they were having their parliamentary elections. Um, and then the following year, 2012, was the presidential election. So soon after we arrived, they started trying to continue with the actions of the revolution in terms of establishing a new government. And then it was quite an historical moment in 2012, the presidential election, the first fully democratic election in the country. Um, were you covering on that at that time? Yeah, yeah, no, I, you know, so I covered all of those, I mean, the parla from the parliamentary elections at, at the end of, of 2011, and then the presidential election. And this was the period when the Muslim Brotherhood was on the rise. So they dominated the parliamentary vote, first of all, and then through the uh, spring and fall of 2012, they were sort of building to what would become the election of the first president, who was Mohamed Morsi. Um, so during that period, and, and the Brotherhood was fairly open during that time, it was, and so I, I met with a lot of their leaders during the, those six months, basically. And um, something I'm curious, uh, Leslie, um, it's to, to, to listen to you speaking a little bit about how was the coverage uh, of what was going on in the country, within the country, and of course the media you could grasp. And also, how do you see the kind of coverage that Aerostring had in the, what we call the, the Western media? Uh, was it a very like idealistic kind of coverage, or uh, was actually f factual? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, one of the things whenever a revolution happens or something called a revolution is in the West we tend to see it in very romantic terms um, and we we tend to think that now that there's been a revolution they're going to become like us you know they're going to become like Americans they're going to build democratic institutions um, and I think a lot of that early coverage was very euphoric and you know to have seen this happen, to have to have seen people go to the square every day and bring down a government is a euphoric moment. You can't help being emotionally affected by that. But you know, I think a lot of the coverage didn't um, look enough beyond that to, to look at some of the flaws. I mean, what happens when you have a revolution that takes place basically largely on social media, young people calling other people to come to the square is you really haven't had that experience of organizing groups and figuring out what your agenda is gonna be and figuring out what's gonna happen the day after Mubarak is deposed. And then what we saw, we kind of missed the euphoria of the revolution, and then we saw what happens after is who comes into this vacuum when the leader is gone. And it's not the young idealistic people that everyone interviewed and focused on, many of whom spoke English and gave this image that Egypt is gonna become this very modern Western place. What moved in was the military and the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what we were able to see is kind of the the disillusionment after the revolution. And I, I think also the, the coverage was so focused on Cairo. You know, and, and Cairo is a dominant city in a way that, say, Beijing is not. Even though I think Beijing gets covered way too much in, in terms of China coverage, you know, Cairo is what percentage? It's 13 million, six, about 16 million out of 90 million. So it's a big percentage, significant percentage, but it just dominates all of the politics. And so it's very easy, I think, to get lost in, in Cairo. Um, and most revolutionary coverage was there and actually just lost in the square in Tahrir, you know, and not even looking at the outskirts of Cairo. Um, so one thing that I did early was I felt like I wanted to see uh, another 
part of Egypt and get a foothold there and try to get some context. And so I, w I had been interested in archaeology, and there was a great archaeology site in a place called Abydos in Upper Egypt. And so I went there initially to do an archaeological story, um, and I continued to follow the, the digs and the, the scientists who were working there, but I also started to work with the local politics and to follow what was happening you know, how they were reacting to the, to the revolution. This is actually, I mean, it's kind of funny because in the past, archaeology was often a cover for spies. You know, it's a very common thing, and, and I sort of used it in the same way because once you're there, they say, oh, that's the foreigner who's writing about the archaeologist, and so then you could go and meet with the local mayor and the other people and just and kind of get a sense of the politics as well. But when I, it was interesting because in that town, there were no protests at the time of Tahrir. It took them 11 months. So 11 months after the revolution happened, they finally held their first protest, and they had about a thousand, mostly young people, came out and demonstrated for two days with signs, and they had the same slogans that had been used in Tahrir. But it was interesting what they asked for. Um, one thing was to remove the rayas, which is kind of like the head of the village. Another thing was to lower the prices for cooking gas. And the third thing was to have lower admission prices for the temple. This, this was a, a Bronze Age temple, the most intact Bronze Age temple in, in, in Egypt, which dates to like 1300 BC. And they had just made the price pretty high because it was the same for tourists and for Egyptians. But these were the three things they wanted. So it was interesting to think about that. One, they wanted to remove the head of the village. That clearly was modeled on the Mubarak thing. The cook, cooking gas was a very pragmatic thing. And the temple, you know, why did that matter to them? Well, because people like to go to the temple. If a woman wants to get pregnant, there's certain things that you go in there and touch if you're a local that have good luck. They, they have these sort of magical beliefs about the relics of the ancient past. And this was very important to them. And it was interesting that it, they removed the head of the village, but they just put him down the road for a month and a half, and then he came back. And nobody said anything else. And then people said, oh, the young people, they just kind of got carried away. The cooking gas, they made some adjustments, but it went back to the old system very quickly. The only thing that they actually succeeded was the temple. Um, and so they were able to go and perform the kind of magical rites again. So it was like this, this view of, 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 you know, the permanence of these mindsets. It was also amazing at that time to go because most of the offices, I would go to government offices. And during this time, people were quite open. You could just walk in and talk. And there was always a nail on the wall where the picture of Mubarak used to hang. And, and there was this empty nail in every office, and sometimes there'd be like a little ring around it because of the sun, you know, because of the sun on the wall, yeah. So you were reporting regularly, traveling uh, as well in the country. Uh, what were the main challenges as a, as a reporter that you, you found there that f perhaps you haven't found in China, for example? I mean, it's, it's a harder place to report in than in China, definitely, um, for lots of reasons. I mean, just... Logistically, it's harder, you know, roads are worse, and, and although it is in a very big country, so that makes it easier. Um, there, you know, things are quite chaotic. Um, people don't keep appointments. You know, I mean, when I, when I look through my language lessons, you know, very early we had this whole list of words, which is like, you know, I'm going to be 30 minutes late, or can we change the appointment, or, you know, like this whole, which in China I never had to use any of those phrases because nobody in China was ever late for anything. Um, so um, in that sense, it could be quite frustrating. But the other thing that was sort of amazing about it is that you could just show up anywhere and just every, you know, like when I went to that government office in that little town in Abydos, people would be waiting outside the office, just ran, there's no system to the government really. And so they just go and talk to the highest official and they've got a totally random you know, there was one time I went there and some guy who was a duck farmer had had some problems with his utility bill. And he's going to the head of the, the you know, of a, it's the 70,000 people that live in this area. And he goes straight to the head, you know. And, and so you would, see, it was very informal. And you could do that too as a journalist. So I would go, like I went to the, you know, Minya has, it's like a province, what they call a governorate. And I went into the office of the highest official, the governor, and just stood outside the door and eventually saw me. There was no, I didn't call ahead or anything. Just imagine like in China going to like Hunan province and just walking into the government building and the guy's going to meet. It never, never would happen in China. Not only that, but when I talked to the guy, he just told me the most, the craziest stuff that you would imagine. Like I, there had been a bunch of violence in his province and I, I said, you know, who was responsible for this? And he said, oh, it was Obama. You know, it was, you know, and he had all these uh, conspiracy theories. He's just telling me this totally openly. And Egyptians, so they're, they're, again, this is a real contrast from the Chinese. So once you, 
they wouldn't show up on time, but once they're there, they love to talk, and they would tell you things that they probably shouldn't. Uh, Leslie, uh, you mentioned the square, so Tahrir Square was quite a symbol of, of the revolution. Um, do you remember the first time you, you went to that square, and uh, do you remember that experience? I do, yeah. We, were, um, we had moved there not very long ago, and there were starting to be protests against the military council that had taken power after Mubarak stepped down. And we went to the square with a friend of a friend who was a journalist there. Is that right? We were meeting somewhere. We were there a long though. Yeah. And yeah, we were, you know, we didn't know what to expect. And we kind of made plans that we would um, meet at a certain place. We'd just call them when Yeah, you. make sure that, you know, we knew where the other person was. And then, you know, once you go there, it's, it's kind of amazing. And it... it it's kind of just a lot of people being Egyptian, you know, like they're chatting and they're having snacks and, you know, you can't have a bunch of Egyptians without there being kind of a party atmosphere. So there's just like, it's very warm and people are all talking and yelling and chanting. Um, but, you know, one of the things about reporting in Egypt is even though people are so warm to you and on a day-to-day -day level, you become quite cool about the potential danger, there's always the sense of danger um, at least and sometimes real danger, you know, uh, in terms of reporting. But, you know, while we were there, maybe a couple years before we left, there was an Italian researcher named uh, Giulio? Giulio Regeni. Giulio Regeni, yeah. And he was basically grabbed off the street. He'd been researching kind of labor movements, and he was grabbed off the street by no one knew who and tortured for a week and killed and left in a ditch. And it's still officially the murder is unsolved, although it's pretty clear that it was security forces who did this because they had been so worked up to make sure that no foreigner or no one does anything that's going to upset the stability. So they probably, somebody just took him as ex an example. And so, you know, during my last two years there, I was reporting a lot among young women who were working in factories, and it certainly wasn't about organizing and labor movements, but... You know, in the back of your head, there's always this feeling like maybe somebody's going to grab me and misinterpret what I'm doing and, you know, leave me in a ditch somewhere. So, you know, even though China has a very strong police state and it's a political dictatorship, you do feel going around reporting that you're generally, your safety is guaranteed, right? That things are functioning and that even if you do something wrong, hopefully there is some kind of process in which these things happen. And in Egypt, you feel like most of the time, nobody's paying attention to you because they're way too disorganized to worry about you, but that if you catch them on the wrong day, something really bad could happen to you. Um, so, you know, we really enjoyed the time that we were there, but the minute I left, I was just like, I can't believe we just did that with our little kids. Like, I'm so glad that we got out alive. But you forgot one thing. And the first time we went to the square, I got robbed. Oh, that's true. The first... So that's a very small detail I'd that's quite that important. We got, yeah, well, everybody was friendly and there was a party atmosphere and then suddenly a scrum developed and we're kind of getting pushed by this mob of people and my wallet was gone, you know, and so <laughs> I was lucky my passport wasn't taken too. The very first time I went to Tahrir, I was robbed, yeah. That was unforgettable. And uh, Leslie, you wrote um, in one of your articles that the revolution marked an euphoric moment, but it didn't last. Uh, did you felt that kind of... Um, uh, disappointment in people uh, in the way things turned out in, in the you know in the years after that uh, special moment of 2011 yeah definitely um, you know I one of the stories I wrote was following this group of um, activists who basically started a an independent media organization um, mostly online called Mada and they were all young activists who had been, you know, on the forefront of the revolution um, in Tahrir Square every day, either as protesters but also as journalists covering this event. Um, and definitely, there was there was an incredible sense of disappointment and disillusionment at what this had come to. But at the same time, I feel like they didn't. There wasn't the soul searching that led to what did we do wrong what should we have done better? You know, it, there was a tendency to blame the military and to blame the Muslim Brotherhood for being dishonest and for moving in and kind of um, taking over the revolution. Um, and, you know, in our reporting, both, both Pete and I came around to the feeling that it wasn't a real revolution. You know, just because you remove the top person, um, it doesn't mean that you have changed the political institutions or even as, or more importantly, the social institutions that run the country. 
Um, and among the activists, journalists who I wrote about in this, in this MEDA, this organization, it was really interesting because they would tell all these stories about these incredibly brave things that they did during the revolution and getting beaten up by police and, and, and just being fearless. Um, but at the same time, there was this undercurrent where they would say things like, and then I got home and lied to my parents about where I'd been because I didn't want to upset them, you know, and, and it was, you can't get away from this feeling like it's, it's easier for them to stand up to Mubarak and the police than to stand up to their own parents. And that this very traditional family structure where the young obey the old and the women obey the men um, is still very much um, intact. You know, and that, that is something that more and more we came to realize is, was one of the failures of the revolution. And no, nobody really talked about that. You know, they, they talked about it in terms of the Muslim Brotherhood and opportunism and, and military state, but they didn't really talk about what really needs to change in terms of the relations between people to make it a more equitable society. Peter, could you also feel that uh, sort of failure of the revolution while you were reporting? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, you know, and it's, I, you know, we came at it from different angles from our research products, but I think a lot of the conclusions were the same. Um, there is, I mean, what they needed was a social revolution. What they got was a political revolution, which in the end was quite shallow. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and it sort of connects also to the, la I mean, almost to what I was describing in my textbook, where you didn't have institutions. We weren't learning about parties or government bureaus or things because they don't really exist in Egypt. And the same thing when you go to the upper Egyptian office and there's no system for anything. Um, and so when you, have a, when you have a situation like this where you don't have parties, um, you don't have established institutions, political institutions, I think it's very hard to find a foothold to change. Um, there's a, an influential American political th uh, scientist from the 1960s and 70s named uh, Samuel Huntington um, who wrote a book called Political Order and Changing Societies. And one thing that, I, that struck me when I was reading this book in Egypt was he described a certain type of state that's fundamentally unstable. And he says when the, it's a fundamental problem when the participation in politics has outstripped or outpaced the institutionalization of politics. And I think as journalists, there's a tendency not to understand this because when you're looking at the individual it can be very inspiring. You have this person maybe from a slum in Cairo who has come all the way to Tahrir Square and is carrying a sign and says they want change. It's, it's, it's a very inspiring thing to see. But you need to think about, is there an institution behind that individual? Is there a way for that person to, you know, to participate in something other than a street movement? Um, and this was the real problem in, in Egypt. And so what you, have, what you have in a situation like that is every sort of group just does whatever they can to grab power. So the young people, and 60% of the people were 25 and under, the young people would protest. That's all they could do. They have no other way to participate. So that's what they do all the time. The police do what the police do. The, the courts were always making decisions about different things and throwing out the parliament or throwing out election results. So the courts are doing their thing. And, and then you have the military. And what can the military do as the tension built in 2013 when the Muslim Brotherhood was in power, you kind of realize the military actually has no political tools either. It's not a political actor. And so they really had two options. One is you do nothing, and two is you do everything. You know, there's nothing in between. Because it's not a political, you know, there's no political tools. And so it's a very dangerous situation, you know. But I, but I think as outsiders, we tend to see this in an unrealistic light, you know. And it's sort of like, even when I look at it made me think about China differently. Because when you look at 89 with the student movement in Beijing, you've kind of a similar situation. There's no preparation. People are not prepared to participate in politics, but suddenly they are jumping in. It is inspiring, it's uplifting, but what would have happened next? You know, we know what happened, but in an alternative, when the students won, what probably would have happened is a coup, military coup, and then the military uses the students, takes power, and, and goes on and maybe things become more repressive, which is what happened in Egypt, you know. That's not saying that those students were wrong, but it says how difficult it is to change a system when you don't have parties, you don't have institutions that allow people to participate and, and allow, you know, levers of government to be moved in a systematic fashion. You left the country a while ago, uh, Egypt already. Do you keep uh, following that system and what's happening to it uh, at the uh, current moment? 
Yeah, we were both, we, we both have made trips back. I was there actually last month, um, and she was there not long before me. Um, so we've been back in the years since. I mean, basically, what you have now is, you know, CC is the new president, and he's a military guy, and the military is firmly in control. Uh, the, it, the, it's more repressive now than it was under Mubarak. I think there have been some small positive economic changes, um, but the big problem is there still is no institutionalization of politics. So there's no, like CC, like a lot of military people, distrusts politics. He doesn't, he thinks politics is just fighting and arguing. And it's, everybody should just agree. You know, that's his idea. And so there's no parties. He's not, in, he didn't found a party or encourage anybody to, to join a party. And I think this, so you really haven't gotten anywhere with it. Uh, Leslie, uh, Peter mentioned your researches. Of course, you are uh, very interested in uh, social topics. You wrote Factory Girls about the workers in, in factories in China. And you were w also uh, working closely uh, with women in, um, in Egypt. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so as I mentioned, I was looking for a way into the story of women in Egypt. And um, I finally hit on the idea that the, the discovery that the rate at which women work in Egypt is one of the lowest percentages in the world is about 20% of adult women work in Egypt. Um, you know, in, in places like Europe and the US, it's in the 70s, in China, it's in the high 60s. Um, and even in the Middle East, Egypt is quite low. Um, so I, I started to look at places where women did work and I ended up focusing on two factories. Um, it wasn't by design that I'm once again inside factories talking to women, but that's just how it worked out. Um, so one is a small clothing factory outside Alexandria and the other is a very large foreign invested factory in Upper Egypt. Um, most of the workers come from rural villages and have never worked before. So it's kind of a way of looking at these pioneering women to see what it takes to get women out of the home, what kind of sacrifices they make, and also what changes um, after they work. And one of the really depressing things is the answer to that last question is maybe nothing. Um, even though these women are working and they're often making money, that is a big part of their family income. It doesn't really bring them more status in their family and in their village. And in some ways, it actually hurts them because their husband's thinking, well, I'm giving you this you know, opportunity to work, so you have to show me even harder what a great mother and housewife and house cleaner and cook and servant for me that you are. Um, so the women are actually working really hard, and they often tell me that they really enjoy the factory work, not just for the money, but because they get to see their friends. It's a way for them to leave the house. Um, but at the end of the day, it is not leading to a social revolution the way in China, when you look at all these millions of young people leaving home, young women leaving home um, and working in the city, it has led to an economic and social revolution where basically young people have more power where, and, and more influence and the old traditional ideas are changing really fast. Um, one, one of the young women I, I followed in China, I was talking to her recently and she was having a lot of problems with her husband and her parents, who are farmers in the village, actually said, well, you should get a divorce, you know? And I was amazed, I was like, oh my gosh, like I was assuming that she would have to push her parents to accept this, and instead her parents said, you, sh you know? So, I mean, that shows the extent of change, and as we know, China came from a very traditional place as well, um, but because of the massive economic and social change, um, people's mindsets are really changing, and that's what's missing in Egypt. I mean, you see many women who are as charismatic, as intelligent, as amazing, or more so than the women we met in China, and yet their personal struggles don't speak to anything larger. You know, it, it, it's, it remains a struggle for them, but it doesn't speak to a movement in which women are improving their lives and supporting each other um, to make the whole society more equitable for them. That's what's missing. And you are now working on a new book on this subject. Yeah, so I finished the research probably over the last year um, with some trips back to Egypt after we left, and now I'm working on the writing of it, yeah. When can we expect it to come out, more or less? Uh, hopefully I'll write it over the next year, and then we'll see. All right. Uh, Peter, you mentioned your uh, archaeological research. I'm sure also probably some, some book uh, coming up uh, uh, at some point about these years in, in Egypt on your side. A book, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, I just finished the first draft, so hopefully, I think it should be out sometime next year. They haven't set a schedule yet, but we'll probably schedule it pretty soon, yeah. And uh, what kind of book is it? 
Um, you know, it's a combination of, uh, it's following the events of the revolution, but there's also some other threads that run through it. One of them is looking at, at um, a person I knew who lived in one, in kind of one of the big informal neighborhoods in Cairo, like of the sort of slums, and who's part of this massive informal economy that really dominates life in Cairo. So sort of looking at average life, and then looking at the village in the south where I was studying archaeology. Um, and so to try to give some perspective on the, on the country. Yeah. Uh, something that I think it's, it's quite interesting about uh, your work, both of you, is that by telling stories of uh, particular people and people that usually are not on the top layers of uh, society, let's say like that, uh, you manage to portray uh, uh, a society, a country, a city, uh, with that uh, specific story. Do you do you believe that uh, one individual story can speak uh, to 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 a large audience by kind of telling the narrative of a country, or that's also the power of, of nonfiction and, and, and journalism? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's although you know I don't go into it thinking that this person is going to tell the whole story of Egypt, but it's it's to me it's I think there's basically you know it's partly because I tend I was trained in literature, and I, I studied literature in college. I wanted to be a fiction writer originally, um, and I was not really a very political person ever. And so for me, the starting point is usually not an issue. Um, it's usually either an individual or a place, and that's partly, if you know, what, that's what literature tends to be based on. It's not based on ideas, or the ideas come into it, or, or you know, or themes, or or issues, but you start with a person or with a place. And so that tends to be how I ground my work. And in some way, that's just a literary sensibility. It's, it's, it's often not really a decision that's political, actually. Yeah. Still about your work in Egypt, you, you also reported a little bit on, on the Chinese uh, community that you, that you found there. Any, any interesting stories that you'd like to share? Or about yeah, that? no, I, you know, I, I didn't uh, go in there planning to write about China, but I met Chinese in the south by random, just by chance, and they were, they were selling lingerie, and they were in all of these towns all along the Nile. I would find Chinese people, and they were all doing the same thing, which is selling women's lingerie. Um, and so when, after I met the first couple of people who were doing this, I just thought, this is so weird, you know? And, and so then I started going in every city. I would go, like I went into Asyut, which is about 400,000 people, and I, I, would, I had a car, and I would drive by myself, and I drove, and I parked, at the outskirts of the city, and then I waved down a cabbie, and I said, are there any Chinese people here? He's like, oh yeah, get in. And then he takes me to this place, and we stop, and there's a big sign in Arabic, and it says Chinese lingerie, you know, and so it, and so it was this weird thing that I kind of got curious, but it turned out that it was a very useful window into both Egypt and China, um, because there, was, there were very culturally specific reasons why that product was important. It was part of the marriage process in Egypt. They, they, when you get married, you have to buy this lingerie. Um, they were also they were, they were selling very light dresses that women would wear at home, because in Egypt, women wear so much stuff in public, and it's so hot that when they get, go home, they, just, they have to change into a totally different wardrobe that's somewhat functional. And they can do that because there's no men there, no men who are not in the family. And so, it, you know, the Chinese were, had figured out this niche, and so they were exploiting it. Um, so it was a really fascinating way. So I, the Chinese are also in my book <coughs> because they kind of provide this very odd left-field perspective that nobody would really, you know, and, and they're very, they're, 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 their perspective is so different from the Westerners. And in some ways, I found it clearer um, there's no colonial history there. There's no guilt, and so they're not. And the Chinese aren't committed to either Israel or to Palestine. Um, it's just less complicated. So I, I found that the people there that I met, the Chinese, often saw things very clearly. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I think now maybe we can open the, the ground to some questions. If anyone wants to join in the conversation, questions? Anyone? On there. Thank you. It was really interesting to, to listen to you both. Uh, I was just wondering because I heard a lot of criticism of, about how the things were done. Although I believe that maybe this generation, this Arab Spring generation, is uh, the largest, best educated and uh, most highly urbanized generation of young people. 
for these countries. Um, and also I believe that uh, those cut off from changing their own societies by democratic means may turn their anger inwards or outwards. Do you believe that this kind of uprise should have been done in a different way? What, what, were, what, what was really the, the main um, strategies that failed? If you can outline a few. I mean, I, I don't think you can, I don't like to blame the young people because I think the conditions created the movement, you know, and so I don't feel like, and there's all this second guess, you know, they should have done this or they should have done that. I, I don't agree with that, but I think that it is important to think about certain dynamics. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly young country, 60%, as I said, or 25 and under at the start of the revolution. Um, and young countries tend to have more trouble with democratic transitions. That, that's, that's statistically true. Um, and it kind of makes sense. I mean, people are not fully prepared. They're not fully institutionalized. And so it's harder for them to find a foothold other than going and throwing rocks at the police, right? You can't really blame them for that. Um, if there's also, I mean, I think when we looked at this as outsiders, you see all these young people on Tahrir and you think, wow, I mean, this is a powerful movement. We think about it as democracy. Um, there are so many of these people, 60%, they are going to dominate the country. And one of the, you know, I like talking to archaeologists just because it's kind of a hobby, but sometimes you get interesting insights from them. Because I, I wrote a story about watching a village election, and I was really struck when I watched the election in this local village, how the routine was that the elders would decide how everybody voted, all the men, the young men, the women, and when they went on these campaign visits, the candidates would visit these extended families, and the young men would be there to serve them tea, and, what I, and, the, and the old guys would say, you know, bring me chocolate, or, you know, they'd make these orders, and the young people would scream, and these are like men in the prime of their, you know, 25-year-old men are doing this stuff for the old guys, and you're just wondering, why are you doing this, you know? Um, and one of the archaeologists who works in that area, they, they, they had just excavated a big cemetery from the 1300 BC. Um, and he's like, yeah, what you're describing is exactly, in the cemetery, he said, very few people lived to be 50, almost, you know, very few people. More than half were dead by the age of 25. So it's, he said the reason is different from what you're describing. In here, it's a, it's a high birth rate. We were looking at a, a high death rate. He said, but the effect is the same. It privileges the elders. And so, you know, I, it, I hadn't thought about it that way. By having more youth, you cheapen them. Think about it in terms of supply and demand and not in terms of democracy. It doesn't actually give them more power in some ways. It actually can be a situation where they have less power. Um, so, you know, these are the kind of things that you, you kind of, after five years, I started to realize this. But it's not easy when you first go there because you're just impressed by these numbers. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Anyone else? Well, I have a question. Of course, um, this became a very defining moment for Middle East and um, in Northern Africa, the, 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 what we call the Arab Spring. Um, I'm sure when you moved there, you were probably doing your readings as well. And uh, could you share with us um, some of uh, those probably interesting books that you came across while you were preparing yourselves also to to, to grasp the surface of that country? Um, I, we didn't do much preparation, to be honest. I mean, we, neither of us had ever been to Egypt before we moved there, um, or, you know, or, or to the Middle East. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I think in some ways it's nice to arrive without many, many, uh, many preconceptions. I, I mean, the best book that I read in terms of a literary book about sort of modern Egypt um, is called um, In an Antique Land by Amatov Ghosh, who is an Indian. He's a novelist. He's a very well-known novelist now. But as a young man, he was actually studying to be an anthropologist, and he did research in villages in the Delta, and it's really nicely done. I mean, he spoke Arabic well, um, and, and that book has really good observations. I think actually there's a, there's a shortage of good books about the region because people people don't stay in the same place long enough, basically. They kind of jump from conflict to conflict in terms of the reporters. It's not like China. Very few of them speak Arabic, actually. You know, China is unusual. I mean, you look at the nonfiction that's come out of China in the last 20 years, I think it's very impressive. 
you know, and there's a big range of voices. There's, diff there's different types of writers doing it, different approaches. It's a really impressive body of work, and that's very rare, I think, in the developing world. And that's partly because you can go to China, learn Chinese, and it's a systematic place. You can live there for long enough to get, your, to get a foothold and learn something. In Egypt, it's hard to do. In the Middle East, it's hard to do that. Yeah, I think uh, it's one of those places that got a lot of attention, and then there was a spurt of books that were quite often written quite quickly, and then attention moved elsewhere. Um, so I think there are a lot of quick books about the place that are not that insightful. Um, on the other hand, there is a great deal of scholarship about Egypt, um, as, as Pete studied the archaeology. Um, one of the areas that I've been reading about is kind of what Islam says about women, and there's actually amazing scholarship. Um, there's actually a group of women called Islamic feminists who are Muslims, but they believe in looking at the Quran and the religious tradition and finding space for women and women's rights within that tradition, um, which might sound really quixotic or strange Islamic feminists, but um, their argument is actually that the Quran is in many ways a radical text, um, one that acknowledges the spiritual value of men and women equally. And there are a few clauses in the Quran that suggest that men have certain responsibilities in a marriage and women have others. And these clauses have been used to justify men oppressing women and men controlling women for hundreds of years, but that perhaps the book itself actually says something different. So there's a lot of scholarship um, that I think is really valuable, but it's it's not for a general audience. It's it's mostly you know professors writing these these issues, but very important subjects. Uh, you you have spent some years in China in Egypt. You are probably relocating relocate to China soon. Uh, would you see yourselves in the future choosing another another country uh, to move with, with your family? And what country would that be? Uh, I don't know. We're kind of tired, so <laughs> it, we're looking forward to going back to China because, um, you know, one of the things about being away from China and being somewhere else is you see it in clearer lights, and one of the things I don't think we adequately appreciated when we were in China was that things actually work, um, and and it's easy to get a lot of things done, and, and as Pete said, Pete sh uh, people show up on time, and they answer your phone calls, and... and you know, these little things, you don't appreciate them until people stop doing them to you. Um, so this next phase, we're looking forward to being back in China and having a different view of a different time, um, but in a place that is familiar to us. Um, in terms of moving to another country, I think someday we'd like to live in the Middle East again, um, maybe when our kids are older and um, if we still have the energy to go back to the Middle East and, and work on our Arabic and hopefully there will be more peace in the region, and I mean, our original idea was actually to live in Syria, um, because everyone said Damascus is just a beautiful city, and and that was our original plan that that we shelved even before all the political chain, uh, political chaos there. Um, but we would like to go back someday and kind of see it at a different phase, hopefully a more optimistic phase. All right, a question there. Microphone. I will give you one. Thank you. You just mentioned about the social change and the, the political change in Egypt. So, uh, as you observe, uh, as and you you observe as an outsider. So, what's the main hinder um, for Egypt to have a social change? It's uh, the country is not uh, is not prepared well for the social change. So, um, so they just has a has a superficial political change. What what's the uh, how um, um, regarding the social preparation? What, uh, what which is the hinder like uh, the religion? What's, what's holding it back? Yeah, what's holding it back? I mean, I, I think there are various reasons. Um, you know, education, broadly speaking, is a big issue. Um, you know, more than 25% of the population is illiterate. Um, you know, when you would have elections, every candidate has a symbol because so many voters are illiterate. You know, and so you'd ask people, who'd you vote for? And he's like, I voted for the boat and the car. You know, <laughs> people, you know and so it's like, you can see it's difficult to, have, to spread information and to prepare people to participate in a, in a democracy if the, the education is that is that bad, and you know, and, and so this is a really big problem, and it's the education has been sort of 
falling for a long time. The other sad thing about Egypt is people always talk about it being a more cosmopolitan and a more promising place in the past. And, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, it was much more upward looking. You know, there are many periods not that long ago when it looked like it was, you know, in better shape than, than China. Um, so it's sort of, a, you know, that's a, a, sort of a tragedy of it. And education is a big part of that. I think that's part of it. I think, as I said before, also just the lack of structure um, which goes from the, from the top down. You know, when I went, you know, in China, I did research in a very small village that was a couple hours outside of Beijing where I rented a home. And this, at, at the time I started going out there, it was quite remote. It was at the end of a dead end road, a dirt road. Um, and so people there didn't have lots of contact with Beijing. But when you went into the, when you went into the village, the top official was a Communist Party official, and she was a woman. And so this told me, this tells you that, obviously, you know, because in a village tradition, they wouldn't, not only was she a woman, but she had married in from another area. So she's not even a native. And she's definitely in charge in this place. And that shows you that this institution, the Communist Party, is in charge, even in this small place. It's not a local clan. It's the party. They put this woman in, and she's very capable. And it doesn't matter that she's a woman, that she's an outsider. She's the top official because they said so. Whereas when in Egypt, when I did, I did research in a village, and I looked at a, at a local election, and there were nobody even pretended to be connected to national parties. It was all based on families. And so everything was totally localized. There was no sense of, of, of structure, no connection to Cairo. Um, so that's a big difference, you know, and I think when you don't have institu you know, things institutionalized down at the lowest level, then you're still looking at village politics. And I think even Cairo is sort of still run by village politics. Sorry, and I just, uh, I'm very curious, and like, uh, compared to China, so you have uh, both the experience of living in China and Egypt. So in China now, the, the education is much better than before. And uh, many uh, young people are educated. W uh, then, what's the um, hinder for the social change or political change? So, um, can it relate it to? Uh, th it, there might be many reasons. Um, is there related to the personality of Chinese, or like we are very pragmatic? Um, not really. Many people are not really so idealistic. Like, uh, um, is it? also linked to the um, personality of the uh, of uh, um, of Chinese I, I'm just thinking about Egypt and mm -hmm. China mm -hmm. and the, about the social change yeah I, I think it's a good question um, I mean one of the things is that the changes that have been wrought in China over the past 20 years have benefited a large number of people. Um, so even though people do obviously have dissatisfactions with the system, um, for example, the recent constitutional change to you know, uh, cancel presidential terms, um, my sense is that most Chinese that I've met are against it in some degree, to some degree. But when you look at the changes that the leadership has brought about over the past 20 or 30 years, the vast majority of people have benefited in terms of better jobs, more mobility, um, opportunity to travel, to marry who you want, to save money, to go abroad. Um, so even though people have dissatisfactions, I think generally they feel invested in the system and the changes that the system has brought to their own lives. And it's really different from Egypt where the system has brought them nothing except deterioration and maybe having the same wage that you had 20 years ago that now buys much less because of inflation and, and poor economic policies. Um, so, you know, getting back to your other question, why, what Egypt needs to do, I mean, one big lesson from China is that we both learned or took from China is that social change often comes from economic change. Um, and you know, when you looked at these girls who are going from the village to the factory and then they're going back and changing village mores, a big reason why they succeed is because they're making enough money to make their parents listen to them, you know. And in Egypt, there's never been that degree of economic growth. So there isn't this 
a philosophy that I need to change, I need to get better, I need to learn more in order to catch up with society and not fall behind. In Egypt, the instinct is a fear of change. Even if the woman goes out to work, she has to prove to her family that it isn't changing her, you know, because the, the instinct is towards stasis and to protecting what they have. It's super, super, super conservative um, because the growth has not brought them good things. It's only brought them more of the same or even bad things. Yeah, I mean, I think also when you look at the, at the difference between these places, I always felt like in Egypt, people were disgruntled. They had the sort of motivation to try to do something, at least in terms of street movement, to have a revolution, but they lacked the ability to carry through, partly because of education, partly because of lack of structures. I felt like the Chinese have the ability. Education level's high. They're used to participating in structures. It, I think, I believe China could be a functioning democracy. I think people are prepared to do that, but they lack the motivation. So it's sort of the opposite of what Egypt has. They had sort of motivation at some level, but they just couldn't follow through. The Chinese, there's nothing that's pushing them to that first step. And again, demographics is part of it. You know, China is not a particularly young country. Most people don't have siblings. I'd meet these kids in Tahrir who are fighting with the police, and you know, this one kid, I remember he's like eight or nine and he'd been shot by a you know, bird shot and, and his foot and he was hurt. And he, I said, well, what'd your parents say? He's like, oh, I got five brothers, you know. So, and so I just told him I got hurt playing soccer. He's like, well, first of all, in China, if you told your parents you were playing soccer, they'd probably punish you anyway because you should have been doing your homework, right? You know, but if he, the last thing a kid would be doing would be putting himself at risk out on the street. He's probably the only kid in the family. Everything's regimented. So how do you get, you know, how do you get something started when the young people are so incredibly focused on the treadmill in China? You know, it's not at all like Egypt. I mean, these people had nothing to do, the kids. You know, they're in these terrible schools. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, all right, everyone, we are running out of time. We have a lot of sessions uh, coming up this afternoon from now until uh, 7 p.m. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here, especially to thank Peter and Leslie for being with us. Their books are available outside. Still not about Egypt, but all the other ones. And uh, please stick around, and I'll ask to, I'd like to ask for a round of applause to Peter and Leslie. Thank you.